Welcome to Monet Cafe. I'm artist Susan Jenkins. Come on in the studio with me. And today we're still painting wintry scenes. In this lesson, you'll see me work with oil paint and pastel. And by the way, this is a real time tutorial. And I loved what I discovered working on pastel matte with another, yes, oil wash. I used oil paint to do a wash or a, a loose underpainting of sorts. Let it dry and then apply pastels. And I even added snow with a technique a little bit different than the last couple of videos I've done adding snow. So get ready for an action-packed, full of information tutorial. And we're going to paint this beautiful scene that is from unsplash.com. I love this site for copyright-free reference images. Grant Lemons, thank you for this lovely photo. Oh, and if you haven't subscribed to this channel, I hope you will and click the bell icon to be notified of future videos. I began the process with a simple sketch on my pastel mat, and I believe my proportions were square. I've been really liking a square format lately. And as always, if you're a patron of mine on my Patreon page, you always get my cropped reference image and typically my color notes, my color guide. I think I missed doing that for this particular video. But uh, one of the main points of this video is teaching about this oil underpainting wash technique. Uh, but you know me, you're going to get lots more information. Somebody made a comment recently, said, wow, you talk a lot. <laughs> and uh, I thought that's the point of an instructional video, right? But you can always turn the volume down. All right, so all I'm doing here is I'm using a new pastel made by Prismacolor. It's spelled N-U pastel, not N-E-W. I love these. Uh, they come in multiple sets of different um, quantities. And um, I like them because they're nice for sketching. And they don't take up a lot of tooth of the paper because they're a little bit harder than most of your soft pastels. Now, I want to talk a little bit about this pastel matte surface. It is awesome. I often buy the colored sheets. They come in various sets or pads with different colors. And I like those because I don't usually like working on white. Well, when I do use white, it's because I'm going to do an underpainting either with watercolor or in this case, the oil painting. And I like a white surface to be able to do this with. And so it's nice that it comes in a white surface. Now, one thing I love about the pastel mat is it's not super gritty. If you've worked or learned a little bit about pastel painting, um, you know that sanded surface often get a lot of praise because the sandiness of the surface is what allows you to get a lot of layers down and the layering is what gives that vibrancy of color and color interactions but if you work on unsanded surfaces uh, your paintings can end up being a little bit flat. Not to say you can't work on unsanded surfaces. I often do, and you can still get some really good results. But the neat thing, again, about the pastel mat is that it's not super gritty. Some people have a hard time with all the texture of some of the professional sanded surfaces. Now, the sketch was super simple, but that's all I need. And now I will be using these Arteza oil paints. You can use whatever oil paints you have. This is a set they sent me to do an instructional video. And it has some of these standard colors that you would get with oil paints. And this is the product I'll be using to, I guess you could say, dilute the oil paint. Someone told me recently it doesn't become paint until you add a vehicle like this. This is odorless mineral spirits made by Gamblin. It's called Gamsol. And I really liked the, using this with the oil paints. I had never used it before. Um, I actually had only used water-soluble oil paints before. So if you're a little funny with chemicals, um, this is odorless, but someone warned me, be careful, make sure you do have ventilation when you use this stuff. And whenever I use oil and often acrylic, I love this Gray Matters paper palette. It's made by Jack Richeson. It's a little waxy, so you can mix your colors on it very nicely, and the neutral color, the gray, is awesome. And here I'm showing, uh, actually putting the color onto the Gray Matters palette. I don't use all these colors I put down. I kind of just wanted to show some of them. And I do end up making my own greens, though. Notice I didn't put any green down. I like mixing my greens rather than a, a pre-made green. So you're going to see me do that in this video. And aren't these pretty? I just love how the colors look on the uh, Gray Matters palette here. You know, if you're an artist, you're just 
a color freak like me, I'm sure. Now the brush that I used is a round number 12 brush, and you can use whatever you have. I typically like to use a brush that's a little larger, and this particular footage is from the previous video where I used the oil paints. And I'm including it here just so you can, once again, if you didn't see that video, see kind of my process. I put the Gamsol in a dish and I use it to mix the colors. And I'm thinning it out quite a bit so that this will dry quickly. As I said, that footage was from a previous painting, but I wanted to show I simply save my colors by putting a piece of like saran wrap on the top and you also can put this in your freezer it helps to keep the colors fresh uh, for the next time you pull them out if you're thrifty like me you like to save everything you can so now I've um, superimposed my footage in the upper right corner for you to see um, me actually mixing some of these colors and using my Gamsol product as I mentioned before thin it out a decent amount I'm not putting thick oil paint on. I'm putting thin layers of color because of the Gamsol product because I want it to dry quickly. Oil paint is known for drying uh, pretty slow so the thin layers will ensure that it will dry in a way that I can apply pastels pretty quickly afterwards and I do shoot it with a blow dryer um, that definitely helps it to dry. You can kind of see here um, how thin it is. You can still even see a little bit of the paper showing through. The point of this is to get a loose underpainting, like many of my lessons where I will give a demonstration of an underpainting. The point to me of an underpainting is to give a base of a loose beginning with some beautiful color. In this case, this is what's called local color. It means it's more local to the scene. It's more true to what I see in the image. Of course, you know me. I'm always what I call punching up color. This is definitely more dynamic, but we know the trees are going to be more green and there's some blue in the shadows. The snow is going to be more white or gray or purple, whatever. Um, I'm not doing what I often do, which is called a complementary underpainting, where I give some sort of red or gold or pink even. And I have some of those coming up, by the way. But the point again, underpainting is to get some fresh, beautiful color down and a value study. I'm giving myself a roadmap of the uh, correct values or, or close to the correct values before I even get started applying the pastels. And again, it's just a painterly feel. And that's what I really love about a nice, loose, artistic underpainting. And I really enjoyed this technique so much that I will definitely do more oil washes, as I'm calling them, as underpaintings. It was really a lot of fun. And I wanted to give a little tip here. With evergreen trees, the leaves kind of zigzag, almost like a little Z pattern, whether you're painting them in oil or pastel. And uh, I do give a little bit more of that impression when I get to the pastel. And in the future, I'll go even more loose with this. I was still kind of learning it as I was working, but uh, I will probably even get it more um, uh, diluted and let some colors even drip and blend into each other and uh, that definitely will help with the feeling of impressionism. I'm jumping ahead just a little bit here to show you some of the colors that I'm using for trees that are behind other trees. I love to give cooler tones when something is more in shadow or behind something else Typically, with a situation like this, the values will get a little darker, you know, if it's in shadow, and also they'll get cooler in color temperature, blues and purples. And even if you don't see them in the scene that way, you don't see blues or teals or purples, as long as we use the rules that are inherent to nature, uh, we can exaggerate. And I love to share that because that's one of the questions I get all the time is someone saying, how did you know to put purple there? Well, I know that in the shadow, things can cool off. Uh, so I will use blues or purples and shadows, even in the snow. Even when something you think your brain tells you it's white, uh, you can give it more color following the simple rules. In some of my videos, I have actually um, a layout, a guide as to how color and value behaves in a landscape scene. And it's just a neat little simplification 
of the rules of value and uh, color in a landscape painting and it makes it really easy and I, that's what I like to do for you guys so if you're on my patreon page I'll try to include that guide in this video uh, once again if you're a patron you get extra goodies and I can give you more content and often you get extra footage too as well plus you guys are awesome I get to see your work it's really cool and I'm speeding this up a bit now so we can actually get to the pastel painting, but I wanted to show you with the background trees. They also follow the rules I was talking about with landscape painting, which is values typically get lighter in the distance. So think of it as layers, darkest values in the foreground, especially for perpendicular items to the land, like trees, you know, there's things upright and uh, they will have a layering of gradually just getting lighter as things recede into the distance and for this i basically just thinned out the oil paint even more and you can see here how i'm just kind of giving those little zigzaggy marks also things in the distance get less detail uh, they get a little fuzzier too they're a little more out of focus and if you accentuate these things uh, you can create a painting that is more painterly and often isn't really what you see in the photo. Photos have a tendency to try to focus everything. So you have the opportunity as an artist to break out your artistic license, uh, exaggerate some of the colors based on the rules, how they work, and also get creative with where the focal point is. And as the artist, you have the ability to bring your viewer into what you saw or what you see as beautiful in the scene. I have another video, I believe it's called Five Ways to Create a Focal Point. And I'll tell you what I learn from creating my videos. Often it's a subject that I'm exploring even more. And as I always say, I bring you guys along with me with my learning. And that video was eye-opening for me as well as I explored focal point and what creates strong focal point in art. And for the sky here, you can see I've created what I would call like a periwinkle blue, little purple blue color. And I typically, according to the rules of how nature behaves, I usually have the upper heavens a little darker in value, just a tad, it is a sky after all, gradually getting a little lighter as it gets down towards the horizon line. I'm using some of the same for the snow, lightening it up a bit. Uh, the snow is pretty light, but there are gonna be areas of shadow. And you can see how much I've thinned this out and um, by the, the sheen on the paper. Here you can see where the trees are. I've created a nice purple to go underneath the trees for a shadow. I'm sorry for my little thing in my bun of my hair sticking out. I didn't quite wrap it up enough, so it looks kind of weird right there. Uh, so hopefully this little presentation of showing you how I created this oil wash on the pastel mat will help you if you want to do it. Now you can do it on any water-friendly surface. I could do this on my Fisher 400 that I often use, which is almost is just like you art 400 sanded paper but Fisher 400 doesn't curl I've been buying that a lot lately and if you saw my last video on using oil and pastels together that was the one where I missed the footage this particular type of footage where I was applying the oil paint first and I said I've got another video coming where you'll see the process this is that video and on that one I actually used the oil wash technique on uh, a paper that was not sanded. I put clear gesso down, which you see in the background, that white bottle to the right over there. I put clear gesso down to get a little grit to the unsanded surface, and then I applied the oil wash on top of that. So you can even do this on unsanded surfaces, as long as they're water friendly as well. If you're hearing some rumbling in the background, we're having a wonderful thunderstorm going on as I'm creating this tutorial or the, the voiceover for the tutorial. And uh, it's just real cozy. I got my coffee and it's awesome. All right, so there you have it. And as I mentioned before, I'm gonna do this even more loosely in the future, but I've got my values in, my colors in. Here's the big aftermath mess. And here's where I was shooting it with the blow dryer, forgetting about my head getting in the way. <laughs> so now we can start putting pastel down. The pastel set that I used for this is the Sennelier, it's a French company, Paris collection. I used this set, I believe exclusively for this painting. I love the set. It is on sale 
at the making of this video anyway on Amazon. I have an Amazon shop. I'll put a link in the description of this video where it'll take you right to it. It's a great sale. Uh, if you're brand new tr experimenting with pastels, I know some of these sets can get expensive. I do have a little suggestion list in my Amazon shop for pastels and papers I recommend if you're just getting started. This portion is real time, but I'm gonna speed it up in just a bit uh, to make the video size a bit more manageable and not boring for you guys to watch and add some lovely music since according to some I talk a lot <laughs> you guys feel free to comment too and let me know your thoughts because that's how Monet Cafe has become what it is I listen to you guys I love reading your comments reading your suggestions and I take criticism well because I certainly don't know it all and have never known it all. That's why I have had to research so much about learning how to do all of this. If some of you don't know, I was not a uh, professionally trained artist. I did major in graphic design, had very few little art classes, which I loved, and I had to learn all the rest. After getting my kids a little bit bigger, I kind of fell into the medium of pastels because of how user-friendly they are. They don't dry up. You can walk away. They still just sit there. There's no color mixing or other chemicals involved. Uh, so it, there are so many advantages that I found to soft pastels. But back in the Stone Age when I was learning, <laughs> not that old, but they did. I didn't even have YouTube videos to watch. So I had to search around a lot. I learned a lot on a site that was called wetcanvas.com even though pastels aren't typically wet, um, it had a pastel forum, a soft pastel forum. So I asked a lot of questions, I read a lot, I looked a lot, and uh, I started learning and experimenting. And I thought, you know what, when I learn things, I happen to like videography too, in, in case you haven't noticed, I thought I'm gonna videotape and bring everybody along with me on my uh, learning explorations and experiments like I do all the time. So that's kind of the history and the birth of Monet Cafe. So again, I love your feedback and that's how the channel has become what it is. All right, so now you can see I've been developing what I mentioned before about a focal point. Notice the the main tree that's kind of to the left there. I would consider that the main focal point. These trees I just worked on there are a bit more um, just a lead way into the painting. And they, they're going to have darker values because of two things. One, I want them to be a focal point, and when you have contrast, dark values next to light values, your eye automatically goes there. And two, they're in the foreground. They're going to be a little darker in value than things in the distance. And in pastels, we typically work dark to light as we develop um, a subject matter. And with trees, you typically lay your darker values down first, and then you gradually layer the, the top layers. Think of it as building a tree from the trunk out. And uh, so that's how um, I typically work and most pastel artists typically work. It depends on the subject matter you're painting, of course. So now, like I said, I'm adding some of those um, leaves and um, needles, I should call them in this case, where I feel like the sun might just be hitting them. I'm not going for my lightest value yet. I'm working my, my middle value green. And the Sennelier Paris collection has some beautiful foresty color greens. Uh, I really love this set and I can and have often completed full paintings using this set alone, which I do in this case. I believe, I don't think I use another set at all or any other pastels. Um, so I am using the reference image to a degree to as a guide to get an idea of shapes and uh, values for this, but I'm not using it as something that's set in stone. I just get creative. And sometimes I think, am I, am I being a little too messy with this and a little, maybe a little too haphazard? But um, it, it gets refined a little bit more along the way. It's better to work loose and then tighten things up in just the areas that are your focal point. All right, so I believe this is still that foresty green, and then I'm gonna add a little bit of a lighter green. Now I am gonna add the music, 
but pay attention to how values are going to decrease. They're going to get lighter as things go in the distance. But those background trees, I am going to give them more color. And I'm going to make this more interesting by giving them more purples and teals and um, some blues way in the distance there. I'm going to be adding some pretty colors in the snow, some blues, and even kind of a pinkish lavender color in the snow. Um, so enjoy this and then at the very end I'm even going to add some snow. You know if you've watched a few videos before this we've been on the winter theme this month in December and I've had a couple of videos where I've sh shared how I create snow and in this video I do the same but I use a little bit of a different technique. Also if you happen to be watching this video near its creation I have a December promotion for my Patreon page. I've been trying to grow my Patreon page and I've been very blessed that so many beautiful people have chosen to support this channel which keeps these free videos coming. But in December, if you become a patron, you will be entered in a chance to win two original paintings that I created this month. And as long as you're still a patron on January 1st. So you become a patron in December, I'll have the drawing on January 1st. And that'll be fun for me to announce the winner. And also, every patron of mine on January 1st will receive my free 2022 digital art calendar. And it is digital. I mean, you have to print it out or you can use it however you want. But it has many of my original paintings from this past year with some inspirational scripture. Enjoy the rest of this to this lovely song, Angels We Have Heard On High. By the way, this will be uploaded right around Christmas time, 2021. And also to be sure to stay to the end because I'm going to show you my snow technique. And it's a little different than the last tutorial I did of the snowman. And most of this, if you've noticed, has been real time. I'm going to speed up a little bit in uh, just a few minutes. But for the most part, I think you can follow along with this. If you're one of my patrons, I can't wait to see what you do. I'd love to see your work in our homework album and our other sharing platforms. And if you're not a patron and you'd like to share from this tutorial, be sure to tag me on Instagram and follow me on Instagram at Susan Jenkins Artist. All right, I'm really going to be quiet now and I'll see you at the end where we make some snow.
I really felt a sense of peace while painting this. I hope you did while watching it. And here I took a coffee break, said hey to Bob Ross, and I've laid my painting flat for the snow creation. The pastels you see to my left there are the Mount Vision Iridescent Pastels. This was an experiment. I wondered how iridescent pastels would look as snow. Often I clean my pastels with a piece of tissue paper as you're seeing there. I wanted them to be nice and fresh. Sometimes I'll even add other colors for the snow and in this case I think I just used the white. Now I also have my cheese graters, two different size. One's more of a zester and another one is larger for cheese. I'm going to be using a candle. Now this is just a good smelling round candle but I'm using it because of the round side. You can use a rolling pin or a wine bottle, whatever. So this was the technique that I used in the snowman tutorial where I just grate a little bit of the snow with the cheese grater. I find that this Mount Vision pastel though, or I found, it really was very fine little crumbles. So to get some of the bigger flakes of snow, I wanted some variety of the sizes. I chose to use my X-Acto blade. I have done this before and it works fairly well. Um, but I chunked off a few pieces that were larger and you can actually customize this if you want to place them in certain areas. But uh, this way you can get some larger pieces of snow. Right now you're just seeing me kind of scrape it above. You can't see my hands. But I was just scraping off little bits of the pastel and uh, I even split some of them while on the canvas or the, not the canvas I've been oil painting on this I feel like it's a canvas on the surface and here you can see how I'm kind of just scraping and uh, moving it around to get snow in various places for this painting and once you've gotten your snow in place then you simply get a piece of tracing paper I had used this for my other snow creation so I'm wiping it off and I just lay it down. It's a good idea to tape your surface. I did not do that here. And I'm gonna share with you also something I learned. Okay, you know how parents sometimes say, do as I do, not as I, do as I say, not as I do. Well, I, you might even can see it here kind of. When I pushed really hard with this, something about the really soft pastels and the pastel mat almost made it a little bit too blurry. So I decided to, now I'm just kind of trying to um, soften some of the edges here, but I decided to go back and refine some of the painting again. It seemed to blur it out. It, it might look okay on the screen here, but I added a little more pastel even over some of the snow. And then I went back with a little bit of a harder pastel. I believe it was a Rembrandt. And it didn't smush out quite so much and look so fuzzy. It gave me more of crisp snow rather than fuzzy, out of focus snow. But it depends on the technique or the, the outcome you're looking for. I even added some more of that pretty teal color in the background. So here's the final. I'll show you the whole image in a second. And you can see how I brightened it up. But now you can see the snow a little more crisp and fresh. I hope you guys liked this tutorial. I hope you learned a lot. I hope, most of all, you have a Merry Christmas full of love and blessings as we celebrate the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. All right, guys. Happy painting.